Welcome to Elijah and Moses channel. Like, share, and subscribe. And happy to have you here today. I wanted to talk and discuss about why the temple in Jerusalem was never rebuilt and talk about the third temple a little bit. So I hope you enjoy hearing about this because a lot of people do not know the history of what happened that actually prevented the third temple from ever being built. There were attempts to build the temple again, but it was prevented by God. And we see that attempts at rebuilding since the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD, religious Jews have expressed their desire to see the building of a third temple on the Temple Mount. Prayer for this is a formal part of the Jewish tradition of thrice daily Amida prayers. Although it remains unbuilt, the notion of and desire for a third temple is sacred in Judaism, particularly Orthodox Judaism. Now they're the ones that are trying to put that law into place that discriminates against women having a Torah scroll at the prayer western wall. So, this is particularly the desire to build the third temple of the Orthodox Jews and anticipated as a soon-to-be-built place of worship. Initially, the Emperor Hadrian granted permission to rebuild the temple. So, let's talk about a little bit of history and what happened after the destruction of 70 AD because we had the last Jewish revolt known as the Bar Kokhba revolt, and a lot of people thought that he was the Messiah, but of course, he's not. But they were looking for a military leader that would defeat the Romans. Initially, the Emperor Hadrian granted permission to rebuild the temple, but then changed his mind. The forces of Simon Bar Kokhba captured Jerusalem from the Romans in 132 AD, and construction of a new temple continued. The failure of this revolt led to the writing of the Mishnah, as the religious leaders believed that the next attempt to rebuild the temple might be centuries away and memory of the practices and ceremonies would otherwise be lost. As punishment for the revolt, the Romans renamed the city of Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina and the province to Syria Palestina, and Jews were prohibited in the city except for the day of Tishbiav. However, the rabbis that survived persecution were allowed to continue their school in Javnia as long as they paid the Fiscus Judicus. These Jews that were killed were called the Ten Martyrs. They were ten rabbis living during the era of the Mishnah who were martyred by the Roman Empire in the period after the destruction of the Second Temple. And their story is detailed in Midrash Elha Ezkara. Although not killed at the same time, since two of the rabbis listed lived well before the other eight, a dramatic poem known as the Ila Ezkara tells their story as if they were killed together. And this poem is recited on Yom Kippur, and a variation of it is told on Tisha B'Av. The Avot of Rabbi Natan states that Shimon ben Gamaliel and Ishmael ben Elisha ha Cohen were executed while in Roman captivity, having drawn lots to determine who would be first to die. When the lots fell on Shimon, he was swiftly decapitated, and as Ishmael grieved over his friend's death, he was quickly decapitated as well. The deaths of Rabbi Akiva and Hananah ben Terdion are consistent over practically every source, including the embellished accounts in the Elah Etzkera. All that can be gleaned of the execution of Chutzpit, the interpreter, from historical sources is that he was dismembered either as or after his execution, as several sages apparently opined that the sight 
of Husbit's detached tongue lying in the dirt was one of the reasons for Elisha bin Ebuya's apostasy. Eleazar bin Shamua seemingly wasn't martyred at all, as contemporary sources lack any mention of him in discussions of the Ten Martyrs. Then we have an attempt to rebuild the temple by Roman Emperor Julian. It says there was an aborted project under Roman Emperor Julian, who ruled 361 to 63 CE, to rebuild the temple. That's also AD, but the Jews call it CE because AD gives it the connotation that the Messiah came. Okay, so Roman Emperor Julian aborted a project to rebuild the temple. Julian is traditionally called Julian the Apostate due to his policy of reversing Emperor Constantine's Christianization campaign by restoring traditional religious practices and holy places across the empire. As part of this policy, Julian permitted the Jews to build a third temple. Rabbi Hilkiah, one of the leading rabbis of the time, spurned Julian's money, arguing that Gentiles should play no part in the rebuilding of the temple. According to various ancient sources, including Sozomen, circa 400 to 450 AD, in his Historia Ecclesiastica and the pagan historian and close friend of Julian, Amenaeus Marcinellus, the project of rebuilding the temple was aborted because each time the workers tried to build the temple using the existing substructure, they were burned by terrible flames coming from inside the earth and an earthquake negated what work was made. Julian thought to rebuild at an extravagant expanse the proud temple once at Jerusalem and committed this task to Alypius of Antioch. Alypius set vigorously to work and was seconded by the governor of the province when fearful balls of fire breaking out near the foundations continued their attacks till the workmen, after repeated scorchings, could approach no more and he gave up the attempt. The failure to rebuild the temple has been ascribed to the Galilee earthquake of 363 AD and to the Jews' ambivalence about the project. Sabotage is a possibility as in an accidental fire. Divine intervention was the common view among Christian historians of the time. When Julian was killed in battle after a reign of his less than three years, the Christians reasserted control over the empire and the opportunity to rebuild the temple ended. And then there was the Muslims, the Sassanid vassal state. In 610 AD, the Sassanid Empire drove the Byzantine Empire out of the Middle East, giving the Jews control of Jerusalem for the first time in centuries. The new rulers soon ordered the restart of animal sacrifices for the first time since the time of Bar Kokhba. Shortly before the Byzantines took the area back, the Persians gave control to the Christian population, who tore down the partly built edifice and turned it into a garbage dump, which is what it was when the Caliph Omar took the city in the 630s. Then there was the Muslim conquest of Syria. An Armenian chronicle from the 7th century AD, written by the bishop Sibios, states that the Jews and Arabs were quarreling amongst each other about their differences of religion during the siege of Jerusalem, which happened in 637 AD. But a man of the sons of Ishmael, named Muhammad, gave a sermon of the way of truth supposedly at God's command to them, saying that they, both the Jews and Arabs, should unite under the banner of their father Abraham and enter the holy city. Sabios also reports that the Jews began a reconstruction of the temple, but the Arabs expelled them and repurposed the place for their own prayers. In turn, these Jews built another temple in a different location. 
and I know there was uh, another temple in Samaria that was, you know, like it's supposed to be a, an identical model of the one in Jerusalem. And then there was um, something I wanted to mention that, remember I told you when I was studying about Gog and Magog, and that according to various sources, it said the Mongolian race were the ones that their leader was Gog and Magog. Well, it's really interesting. And, and then later on, I showed you about how Gog and Magog are in the city of London. And I showed you the trees, the oak trees named Gog and Magog in London, in England. And how that's related to King Charles coming upon the throne and how that's all going to come down. An interregnum period between the complete domination of the Levant by the Crusader states until 1260 and the conquest of Levant by the Mamluks in 1291, Nachmanides wrote a letter to his son. It contained the following references to the land and the temple. What shall I say of this land? The more holy the place, the greater the desolation, Jerusalem is the most desolate of all. There are about 2,000 inhabitants, but there are no Jews, for after the arrival of the Tartars, the Jews fled, and some were killed by the sword. There were now only two brothers, dyers, who bought their dyes from the government. At their place in quorum of worshipers meets on the Sabbath, and we encouraged them and found a ruined house built on pillars with a beautiful dome and made it into a synagogue. People regularly come to Jerusalem, men and women, from Damascus and from Aleppo and from all parts of the country to see the temple and weep over it. And may he who deemed us worthy to see Jerusalem in her ruins grant us to see her rebuilt and restored and the honor of the divine presence returned. So this was what the prophet Daniel's prayer was, was that the divine presence of God would return and that God's mountain would be restored and the temple rebuilt. This is what Daniel, he was the prince of Judah, so we got the king of Judah in the last days returning from heaven, Jesus Yeshua of Nazareth. And so, you know, at their time, all they saw if you can believe it, is Jerusalem completely in ruins, like nothing was there, it was all destroyed, and so it was very hard for those people to imagine the city ever being rebuilt, let alone turned into what it is today. I mean, can you imagine if they had some sort of vision to see what it is now, how they would have reacted? And, you know, there's more rebuilding efforts now in our day and of course first Israel had to become a nation again then Jerusalem had to be recaptured so that sets it up for the third temple to be built and God's divine presence to return so although in mainstream Orthodox Judaism the rebuilding of the temple is generally left to the coming of the Jewish Messiah and to divine providence a number of organizations generally representing a small minority of Orthodox Jews have been formed with the objective of realizing the immediate construction of a third temple in present times. As we know, the Temple Institute and the Temple Mount and Eretz Israel Faithful Movement. That's the one that Gershon Solomon, who I got to meet, uh, he was really kind to me. He gave me the pictures of the second temple for my book and he just recently passed away. Each state that its goal is to build the third temple on the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, the Temple Institute has made several items to be used in the third temple. Not just several, lots of items. <laughs> you know, they've got everything. The priestly garments, the high priest garment, the crown. You know, they, they even... Um, you know, Rabbi Berger commissioned a crown for the Messiah to be made, so that's ready to go. And he commissioned a Torah scroll that was special to give to the Messiah when he comes to visit there. 
So who's coming to visit very soon? Some people from the UK. So very interesting. Attempts to reestablish a Jewish presence on the Temple Mount. Of course, in August of 1967, after the Israeli capture of the Mount, Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, the chief rabbi of the Israel Defense Forces and later chief rabbi of the State of Israel, began organizing public prayer for Jews on the Temple Mount. Rabbi Gorin was also well known for his controversial positions concerning Jewish sovereignty over the Temple Mount. On August 15, 1967, shortly after the Six-Day War, Gorin led a group of 50 Jews onto the Temple Mount where, fighting off protesting Muslim guards and Israeli police, they defiantly held a prayer service. Gorin continued to pray for many years in the Makama building overlooking the Temple Mount where he conducted yearly High Holy Days services. His call for the establishment of a synagogue on the Temple Mount has subsequently been reiterated by his brother-in-law, the chief rabbi of Haifa, Sha'ar Yashu Cohen. Gorin was sharply criticized by the Israeli Defense Ministry, who, noting Gorin's senior rank, called his behavior inappropriate. The episode led the chief rabbis of the time to restate the accepted laws of Judaism that no Jews were allowed on the mount due to issues of ritual impurity. So these were chief rabbis that were preventing Jews from going on the Temple Mount. The secular authorities welcomed this ruling as it preserved the status quo with the Jerusalem Islamic Waqf. Disagreeing with his colleagues, Gorin continually maintained that Jews were not only permitted but commanded to ascend and pray on the Mount. Gorin repeatedly advocated or supported building a third temple on the Temple Mount from the 1960s onward and was associated with various messianic projects involving the site. In the summer of 1983, Gorin and several other rabbis joined Rabbi Yehuda Getz, who worked for the Religious Affairs Ministry at the Western Wall, in touring a chamber underneath the mount that Getz had excavated, where the two claimed to have seen the Ark of the Covenant. And, of course, they called Gershon Solomon and Supposedly, he was called there, so I don't know whether he actually saw it or not, but the tunnel was shortly discovered and resulted in a massive brawl between young Jews and Arabs in the area. The tunnel was quickly sealed with concrete by Israeli police. Okay, so you've got Jews working against this whole event of the end times. The sealed entrance can be seen from the Western Wall Tunnel, which opened to the public in 1996. The chief rabbis of Israel, Iser Yehuda Unterman and Yitzhak Nisim, together with other leading rabbis, asserted that for generations we have warned against and refrained from entering any part of the Temple Mount. A recent study of this rabbinical ruling suggests that it was both unprecedented and possibly prompted by governmental pressure on the rabbis and brilliant in preventing Muslim Jewish friction on the mount. Rabbinical consensus in the religious Zionist stream of Orthodox Judaism continues to hold that it is forbidden for Jews to enter any part of the Temple Mount. So there you go that's the Orthodox Judaism it says it's forbidden for Jews to enter any part of the Temple Mount and in January 2005 a declaration was signed confirming the 1967 decision on the eve of Shavuot in 2014 or the 6th of Sivan 5774 in the Hebrew calendar 400 Jews ascended the Temple Mount some were photographed in prayer the most immediate and obvious obstacle to realization of these goals is the fact that two historic Islamic structures, which are 13 centuries old, namely the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, are built on top of the Temple Mount. Any efforts to damage or reduce access to these sites or to build Jewish structures within 
between, beneath, beside, cantilevered on top of, or instead of them, could lead to severe international conflicts given the association of the Muslim world with these holy places. The Dome of the Rock is regarded as occupying the actual space where the Second Temple once stood, but some scholars disagree, as do I, and instead claim that the temple was located either just north of the Dome of the Rock or about 200 meters south of it, with access to the Gihon Freshwater Spring, or perhaps between the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In addition, most Orthodox Jewish scholars reject any attempts to build the temple before the coming of the Messiah. Now, a lot of the Jews that live in New York, they are against Israel building the third temple because they're waiting for the Messiah, who they believe the Messiah is building the temple. And of course, I don't have to go into all the thing about that, you know, the Lord said that our body is the temple and that his Holy Spirit dwells within us. We all know this, but this is part of Israel's history and the prophecy of the monarchy of Israel that's going to be restored in the book of Revelation in the last days that sets up that king at the time of Jacob's trouble. And this is going to be a fulfillment for Israel, not the Christian church. Well, this is because there are many doubts as to the exact location in which it's required to be built. For example, while measurements are given in cubits, there exists a controversy whether this unit of measure equals 1.84 feet, the scholarly consensus, or 1.43 feet, put forward by respected historian Asher Selig Kaufman. Without exact knowledge of the size of a cubit, the altar could not be built. And of course they have built an altar and they have sacrificed and consecrated that altar um, for use. The Talmud recounts that the building of the second temple was only possible under the direct prophetic guidance of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Without valid prophetic revelation it would be impossible to rebuild the temple even if the mosques no longer occupied its location. And when I was writing my book, and I know this is going to be hard for some people to believe, I was not looking for the location of the temple. But piece by piece, the Lord started showing me things, and I now believe I know where the temple was located. And I'm not saying this to be arrogant. It's just proven from Scripture over and over uh, uh, again. So I have this testimony of where the temple was located. And I should say also, despite the recent big fanfare of it being in the city of David, is completely not true. So don't believe that. The Lord has shown me where it is, and I tried to get that information to Rabbi Kayam Richmond and his son Hillel when they came here, but uh, was unable to reach them with the letter showing them. It was obviously not meant to be, and at that time. Despite obstacles, efforts are underway by various analytical groups to articulate the benefits to locale and regional constituents and participants to encourage developments that would progressively align in support. It is known from the Talmud that in the time of King Agrippa, Jerusalem was filled with millions of visitors and pilgrims from the entire region. Some current opinions suggest that the potential of spiritual tourism would support the growth goals of the mayor of Jerusalem for 10 million tourists annually. This would provide a significant boost to the economy and would benefit people locally and regionally, many of whom live in poverty. So what's the status of the Temple Mount? Many rabbis interpret Halakha, Jewish religious law, as prohibiting Jews from entering the Holy of Holies. The situation is complicated as the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque fall under control of Muslim clerics, but Israeli police administer its security. 
According to the wonderful CNN, in 1990, rumors that Jewish extremists planned to start rebuilding the temple started a riot in which 17 Palestinians were killed and scores wounded by police gunfire. Now, what happened then was Gershon Solomon discovered this stone that was already cut without hands of men and brought it on a flatbed truck to the location of the Temple Mount and tried to lay this cornerstone to start building the temple immediately and this is what caused this riot. So for all those years Gershon was not allowed to ever go up and pray on the Temple Mount. I think in maybe the last couple of years he was allowed to go up but you know he was close to the time that he died which was just this year and um, in 1996, the Israeli government opened an archaeological tunnel just outside the compound, sparking riots in which so people, most of them Palestinians, were killed. A 2000 visit to the Temple Mount by Ariel Sharon resulted in a clash between stone-throwing Palestinians and Israeli troops who fired tear gas and rubber bullets into the crowd. That coincided with the beginning of the second Intifada. Widely interpreted as having ended in 2005, during the Sukkot festival in 2006, National Union Knesset member Yuri Ariel visited the Temple Mount without incident and the Israeli police witnessed no provocation by the protesters. So Orthodox Judaism believes in the rebuilding of a third temple and the resumption of the sacrifices, Korban, Although there is disagreement about how rebuilding should take place, Orthodox scholars and rabbinic authorities generally believe that rebuilding should occur in the era of the Jewish Messiah at the hand of divine providence. And I'm telling you that what I have written in my book is by the hand of divine providence because I never would have seen it or figured it out unless the Lord had not shown me piece by piece and it's an incredible testimony and although a minority position following the opinion of Maimonides holds that Jews should endeavor to rebuild the temple themselves whenever possible the generally accepted position among Orthodox Jews is that the full order of the sacrifices will be resumed upon the building of the temple this belief is embedded in Orthodox Jewish prayer services and of course we know that they they brought these five red heifers there to Israel to do the red heifer sacrifice over there on the Mount of Olives and I believe as some of the rabbis have stated that the it's the position of their anointed one which means Messiah to perform that sacrifice so this king that they're going to be putting on the throne of David pretty soon, also known as the throne of the Lord, the one that I believe is going to be King Charles III. Now, something else could happen, but it's leaning much more that way. And I told you about my dream about the royal cipher, and that royal cipher was not known until the queen died, and it was revealed what his mark would be. You get my drift? <laughs> the belief is embedded in Orthodox Jewish prayer services. Three times a day, Orthodox Jews recite the Amidah, which contains prayers for the Temple's restoration and for the resumption of sacrifices. And every day there is a recitation of the order of the day's sacrifices and the Psalms the Levites would have sung that day. Conservative reform and reconstructionist authorities disavow all belief in the resumption of sacrifices. So what that is indicating, okay, you have the ultra-Orthodox Judaism. These are the ones that are telling women they want to pass this bill that they cannot read the Torah scroll at the prayer wall, at the Western Wall, nor blow a shofar, nor sing music. I mean, isn't that anti-King David right there? Nor wear a prayer shawl, nor phylacteries. 
or they would go to prison for six months and pay a 10,000 shekel fine. I believe that when they do build the temple, and it's the Orthodox Jewish rabbis that want this third temple, that they are going to implement that law that discriminates against women, and not only women, but anybody that helps and assists them, which the Reform Jews have come there with a Torah scroll and given it to the women to read it at the Western Wall. Now, I'm putting all of this together for you, but it's the conservative reform and reconstructionist Jewish authorities that disavow all belief in the resumption of sacrifices, the korban. So this explains why the Orthodox rabbis want to put this law into place against the reforms and against the women because they are, I don't know about the women, but the reforms and these other conservative and reconstructionists don't want the, the revival of the sacrificial system. So this is why they want to put them in jail. This is why they want to fine them and this is why the ultra-Orthodox are demanding that only their version of prayer be spoken at the Temple Mount at the Western Wall. Only their type of prayer, their version of prayer be spoken there. And none of the Reform or Conservative or Reconstructionist prayers be counted as being able to be said there, nor the women um, having their prayers and the way that they want to worship God there. It's got to be all the Orthodox, the ultra-Orthodox Jewish rabbi way or no way. So Maimonides wrote in the Guide for the Perplexed that God deliberately has moved Jews away from sacrifices towards prayer as prayer is a higher form of worship. However, in his Jewish legal code, the Mishnah Torah, he states that animal sacrifices will resume in the third temple and details how they will be carried out. Some attribute to Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook the view that animal sacrifices will not be reinstituted. These views on the temple service are sometimes misconstrued. For example, Olat Raya, commenting on the prophecy of Malachi, says, then the grain offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to God as in the days of old, as in the former years. Malachi 3.4. Cook indicates that only grain offerings will be offered in the reinstated temple service. While in a related essay from Igrot Hai Ria, he suggests otherwise. Conservative Judaism believes in a Messiah and in a rebuilt temple but does not believe in the restoration of sacrifices. Accordingly, Conservative Judaism's Committee on Jewish Law and Standards has modified the prayers. Conservative prayer books call for the restoration of the temple, but do not ask for the resumption of sacrifices. The Orthodox study session on sacrifices in the daily morning service has been replaced with the Talmudic passages teaching that deeds of loving kindness now atone for sin. Well, it's the Messiah that atoned for sin, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua. In the daily amid of prayer, the central prayer in Jewish services the petitions to accept the fire offerings of Israel and the grain offerings of Judah and Jerusalem are removed. In the special Musaf Admitta prayer said on Shabbat and Jewish holidays, the Hebrew phrase Na'asi v'nakriv, we will present and sacrifice, is modified to read to asu ve'hikrivu they presented and sacrificed, implying that sacrifices are a thing of the past. The prayer for the restoration of the house of our lives, which is the Bet HaMikdash, the temple, and the Shekinah to dwell among us in the weekly Torah reading service is retained in conservative prayer books, although not all conservative services say it. In conservative prayer books, words and phrases that have dual meaning, referring to both temple features and theological or poetic concepts, are generally retained. Now, 
what do the Reformed Jews believe? The Reformed Judaism does not believe in the rebuilding of a central temple or a restoration of temple sacrifices or worship. So this is why the ultra-Orthodox want to put them in jail if they're coming up there and helping the women. They don't believe in the rebuilding of the temple or the restoration of the temple sacrifice worship. It regards the temple and sacrificial era as a period of a more primitive form of ritual from which Judaism has evolved and should not return. It also believes a special role for Kohanim and Levites represents a caste system incompatible with modern principles of egalitarianism. So there you go. When they're trying to remove uh, or diminish the democracy, as I've been saying that they've been doing with the Supreme Court, and they want to put in the monarchy at the last days, if they are indeed doing what I said, putting in a parliamentary monarchy or an absolute monarchy, this is the caste system that would be incompatible with equal rights for women and men to worship at the Western Wall and does not preserve these roles. So furthermore, there's a reformed view that the shul, school, or synagogue is a modern temple. Hence, temple appears in numerous congregation names in Reformed Judaism. Indeed, the redesignation of the synagogue as temple was one of the hallmarks of early reform in 19th century Germany when Berlin was declared the New Jerusalem, huh, and reform Jewry sought to demonstrate their staunch German nationalism, the anti-Zionism that characterized reform Judaism throughout much of its history subsided significantly following the Holocaust and the subsequent establishment and later successes of the modern state of Israel. The belief in the return of the Jews to the temple in Jerusalem is not part of mainstream reform Judaism. So now you see what's going on up there. And that the ultra-Orthodox, they are, it's, it's the, like I told you, it's the Sanhedrin that appoints the king. And they can do it through a system of voting. So they could take King Charles III and put him on that throne very easily if they vote him in as their king to sit on the throne of David, which I believe that that's what they're going to do. And as I've said several of the top primary UK rabbis like Sir Ephraim Mervis he was knighted by King Charles just recently and also David Rosen one of the top rabbis over in Israel that lives in Jerusalem area so while there are a number of differing views amongst Christianity with regard to the significance of the requirement of a third temple being built in Jerusalem, according to writers of the New Testament, the New Covenant spoke of in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, is marked by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the believer, and that therefore every believer's body and every gathering of believers compromise the temple or that the temple has been superseded. Paul illustrates this concept in his letter to the believers at Corinth, which is 1 Corinthians 6.19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? That's kind of really reassuring, isn't it? This idea is related to the belief that Christ himself, having claimed to be and do what the temple was and did, is the new temple. In John 2, 19-21, and that his people, as a part of the body of Christ, meaning the church, are part of this temple as well. And that's why we're all one in Christ, in the Messiah. The result, according to... N.T. Wright is that the earthly temple along with the city of Jerusalem and the land of Israel is no longer of any spiritual significance. Well, that's not true. I mean, God's going to fulfill this whole thing where 
they appoint this king at the last days and set him on the throne and try to reestablish this totalitarian monarchy, the caste system, and they are going to put their, the king is going to put his own thoughts and viewpoints and rules to usurp whatever the people want. The people are going to have no say if they have no voting system. And the king is the ultimate dictator. So you can see how he's going to sit in that third temple and proclaim that he is God as he sits on the throne of God. And that stone of Schoon is said to be Jacob's pillow stone. And we're heading to Jacob's trouble. So it's all very incredible how it falls into place. And these were all things revealed to me by the Lord that I've shared with you. So Paul refers to the church and indeed to the individual Christians as the temple of the living God. To Western Christians thinking acronistically of the temple as simply the Jewish equivalent of a cathedral, the image is simply one metaphor among many and without much apparent significance. For a first century Jew, however, the temple had an enormous significance. As a result, when Paul uses such an image within 25 years of the crucifixion, with the actual temple still standing, it's a striking index of the immense change that has taken place in Paul's thought. The temple had been superseded by the church, if this is so for the temple, and in Romans 4 for the land, then it must a fortiori be the case for Jerusalem, which formed the concentric circle in between those two in the normal Jewish worldview. In the teaching of both Jesus and Paul then, according to Wright, God's house in Jerusalem was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. But God would now achieve this through the new temple, which was Jesus himself and his people. And you know what? And Jesus tells us when he says, I will give you a white stone with a new name on it. Well, the white stones were what made up the blocks of the temple. So you are a building block of that temple and you're building it up on the foundation of the 12 Jewish apostles and the gates are the 12 tribes of Israel. So we're built upon this sure foundation. And it's kind of why I don't believe in these drive-through gospel messages that, you know, are just real fast. You don't get to know God. You don't get to meet Jesus. You, you just are supposed to believe this by osmosis, I guess, and know him. But you really have to study the scriptures to know him, to know who he is, and he unveils himself to you as you get to know him. And, you know, I had been a Christian like my entire life, but it was in 2007 when all these revelations began. Things I never saw before, and this is what happens when you delve into the scripture. You can't just do a McDonald's drive through of here's the, here's the gospel message. Now, say this sentence and you're done. The whole thing, the whole thing is the word of God and we've got to get to know the Lord. But this guy, Ben F. Meyer, also argued that Jesus applied prophecy regarding Zion and temple to himself and his followers. Jesus affirmed the prophecies of salvation with their end-time imagery, Zion and the temple, belonging to the eschatological themes that the pilgrimage of the peoples evoked. But contrary to the common expectation of his contemporaries, Jesus expected the destruction of the temple in the coming eschatological ordeal. So he gave the prophecy that the temple would be destroyed and that people would be worshiping somewhere other than Jerusalem because God was sending his Holy Spirit to indwell the believers and they were no longer going to be worshiping in a building in Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened. Nobody was worshiping there anymore. The combination seems contradictory. How could he simultaneously predict the ruin of the temple in the ordeal and affirm the end time fulfillment of promise and prophecy on Zion and the temple? Well, it's because they rejected their king, and so now they have to fulfill this seven-year time of Jacob's trouble until their king comes and takes out 
this one they've appointed as the king. He's an earthly person that's taking over God's throne. The paradox is irresolvable until one takes note of another trait of Jesus' words on the imagery of Zion and the temple, namely the consistent application to his own disciples of Zion and the temple imagery, the city on the mountain, the, the rock, and the new sanctuary. The mass of promise and prophecy will come to fulfillment in this eschatological and messianic circle of believers. Some would therefore see the need for a third temple as being diminished, redundant, or entirely foreclosed and superseded, while others take a position that the building of the third temple is an integral part of Christian eschatology. The various perspectives on the significance of the building of the third temple with Christianity are therefore generally linked to a number of factors, including the level of literal or spiritual interpretation applied to what is taken to be end-time prophecy, the perceived relationships between various scriptures such as Daniel, the Olivet Discourse, Second Thessalonians, and Ezekiel, amongst others. Whether or not a dual covenant is considered to be in place, and whether Old Testament promises of the restoration of Israel remain unfulfilled, or have all come true in the Messiah. Such factors determine, for example, whether Daniel 9.27 or 2 Thessalonians 2.4 are read as referring to a still future, physically restored third temple. And, of course, there has to be a temple because this person that they put, the king that they put back on the throne of David, is going to sit in that temple proclaiming that he is God. And why will he be able to claim that? Because it is believed that they that he has been appointed by God and therefore is a representative of God. Therefore, he can be bowed down to as God by his subjects. This is what's going to happen when he sits in that third temple and he's going to demand that all of the Jewish people bow down to him. And anyone else that's there will be subject to whatever the king says. And that all makes sense because when you have an absolute monarchy, that is what this dictatorial king can do. So one of the things I revealed in one of my videos was that in an absolute monarchy, in some societies, especially in ancient kingdoms or empires, the king was regarded as a god or identified with some god. This is how he's going to sit in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God because they will see that he's the anointed one that sits on the throne of God and therefore is the representative of God on earth just like the Pope claims. And But this guy is anointed and chosen either by hereditary means put on the throne or chosen by the Sanhedrin members to sit upon that throne, which means he could definitely come from another nation and rule over them as believing that he's got that Davidic dynasty. When you had the monarchy, you had the divine right of kings. In European history, a political doctrine in defense of monarchy absolutionism which asserted that kings derived their authority from God and could not therefore be held accountable for their actions by any earthly authority such as a parliament and originating in Europe the divine right theory can be traced to the medieval conception of God's award of temporal power to the political ruler paralleling the award of spiritual power to the church so basically they did not believe that they sinned and they could do anything they wanted and they didn't have to answer for it. And here's the disadvantages of the absolute monarchy. It doesn't involve a democratic process. Once a monarch decides that is that, there can be no debate surrounding the decision and surely the monarch can't be held accountable for what they just decided. It creates an excess of their fame. Fame can be both good and bad, 
but with an absolute monarch, it can be dangerous. And how can internal changes be expected when the leader in question is as much a beloved figure, or hated for that matter, it involves a leader not chosen by the people. Monarchs get their position by inheritance. This could be bad because there's no telling whether the monarch that succeeds is capable of leading a nation. Giving someone unrestricted political power can be both advantageous and dangerous. One of the major causes of the English Civil War was over fears that Charles I was attempting to establish an absolutist government. Then Louis the Sixteenth of France is considered one of the most successful absolute monarchs given the reign he had over his country and men. To know why absolute monarchy is preferred or detested, take a look at the advantages and disadvantages, which I just read to you. And in that type of monarchy, since it's no longer a democracy, the king can do what he wants and he can demand that the people bow down and worship him if he wants. And this is what's going to happen in the book of Revelation. And he's going to demand that in order for you to buy and sell, that you receive his mark, which I told you in my dream. I had that dream and I only was able to interpret it this year when Charles got his royal cipher. And I realized that that was what was in my dream. That that's the mark of the king. And he will have absolute power. Now, look what's happening to the women at the Western Wall already before the ultra-Orthodox get their bill implemented. And, you know, it will be the same thing. The people are already protesting in the streets of Israel and Jerusalem saying that they are losing their ability to have their say and their vote. And this is exactly leading to this reestablished monarchy where the king has all of this control over the people and the land. And so the Lord, he is the king, but he also marries the land and its people. So he's going to come down from heaven and put an end to that last earthly king that's going to proclaim he's, you know, sitting in the third temple proclaiming himself that he's God because that's what they can declare as an absolute monarch and cause the people to worship them. And unless you do what the king says, there's a punishment that we know all about in the book of Revelation for those that refuse the mark of the king. It all makes sense and falls into place. So, obviously, there was a lot of prophecy that had to be fulfilled. And this fire came up out of the depths of the earth and not only destroyed, you know, the people that were trying to rebuild the temple, but also what was already rebuilt there was destroyed as well. And there was an earthquake and destroyed whatever work they had done to try to rebuild it. So it's not till our day in our time since Jerusalem was recaptured in 1967 after Israel became a nation you can't have a king sitting on the throne over there unless you already have those two things in place and then you know Jerusalem being declared Israel's capital and then the next thing is the temple and the king being reestablished so Obviously, the ancient monarchy and of Israel and Judah, they were the ones that God sent a sword after. He destroyed the whole thing. He allowed his house to be destroyed and, you know, put everybody in the diaspora because they were playing the scarlet harlot against God. And now in Revelation, you've got that restoration of the ancient monarchy with one last earthly king there in uh, restoring the Davidic dynasty with Judah in Israel and you have this king proclaiming that he's God sitting there and everyone else will be subdued you can see how the ultra orthodox are already subduing the Jewish women there at the Western Wall and the reformed Jews that brought the Torah scroll to them 
are being subdued and persecuted and spat on because it's all leading to them gaining control and having a world religion right there in Jerusalem, an apostate thing, bringing all of these religions from all over the world, which is not God. You know, uh, people worshiping multiple gods. It's apostate. So that is going to be mystery, Babylon the Great, right there in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem sits on seven hills, seven mountains. I know people have always thought it was Rome, and people perpetuated that idea over and over and over. Also, um, Mecca sits on seven hills, perpetuate that idea over and over. But think about it. The prophet Daniel was writing about the restoration of Jerusalem, and that fulfillment is for the monarchy to be restored, which it's going to be in Revelation. And the fulfillment of these things, when the scroll of Daniel is going to be opened by Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, and the judgments are coming, because the people have not accepted him as their king. And so God's going to let them have an earthly king for a short space. And he's going to cut that time short. And he's going to descend from heaven with a shout. And as lightning comes from the east, even unto the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. And the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and our Messiah Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua Hanatsri Vimelech HaYehudim, Jesus Christ, King of the Jews, the very title that was put on his cross as he bore the sins of the world. And the blood of the Lord God of Israel is the only redeeming blood by which we are given Yeshua salvation. Amazing history. And if you don't know the history, you're going to miss so much. And you're not going to have these revelations fall into place. You know, you got to have more than a drive-through gospel message. you got to have more than the McDonald's version of salvation. And know the king, the real king. So when you meet him face to face, you can say, Hey, you did this, didn't you? And we'll be like, yeah, you did, you did. <laughs> so we'll be excited, you know, to see him. And the fact that we believe without seeing, and those who supposedly see God, the ultra-Orthodox, have been blinded so that they won't see him until this time is fulfilled for Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble, till they do that seven-year span of the time of their king upon the earthly throne that they see as the anointed one, who can proclaim that he's a god and cause the people to bow down. And if they won't take the king's mark, then they will be killed, essentially, the court can make, the Supreme Court, which will be the Sanhedrin, can make that ruling. And, of course, this feeds into all the Noahide laws and all that, which I've told people to go to Stephen Bendenoon and Yana, his wife. They did a detailed thing about the Noahide laws. I prefer not to talk about it just because of, you know, they, they've got an in-depth study on that. And we already know that those laws have been put into place. And so... They are behind the scenes putting all of this into place. And you know when Donald Trump said that there were some mighty powerful people that were angry with him? Could it be that the mighty powerful people were the ultra-Orthodox Jews that are trying to get all of this to happen so that they can elevate themselves to be above the Gentile world which are seen as dogs under their feet? That's what I think. So you've got this apostasy coming there, a world religion and the world government, and the king ruling over it all. And that king is about to be coronated this spring, I believe. 
And then when he comes to visit Jerusalem, guess what? They've already got a Messiah crown for the anointed one. And they've already got the Torah scroll for the anointed one. An earthly king, they will say, is their Messiah. Because they see him as just a man, an earthly figure. And he has a background in the Royal Navy. So he's a military man. These are some of the most astonishing details that people never saw and have never been revealed. This is only being revealed before your eyes to us in our generation. And we were born for this time and this day and to present these things to people so that they are prepared and know what's coming. The Lord is in control of this testimony and I'm praying that it is going places by the power of God and by his hand. There's nothing I can do to make people listen. But God will send the people to me that need to come and listen. The very fact that we are not only being able to see these things, but God is giving an interpretation that has never been known before at this time says that King Jesus is coming for his church, his bride. And it's really unbelievable. So hang on. Please keep watching. Support my channel. Like, share, subscribe. And I'll see you later, guys. Thank you for all the prayers. I really appreciate it. And it has helped me tremendously. Um, thank you with all my heart.